All right, so now we're just going to look at, um, we're going to try to prove uh, that the Green's function for the Dirac equation works in this case that we've proposed earlier, right? So this is the equation of motion again in the case that we're looking at a delta function for the potential, right? Again, the delta function tells us that we have a particle at that point, x mu, or at that distance, x mu minus, minus y mu, okay? So we have some, again, we have some particle uh, located at the, some location, and we're going to put in that what we postulated to be the Dirac Green's function into here, and we're going to see if we if this all works out. All right. So this is really just going to be a proof video, uh, just for our own peace of mind to make sure that we're working with the right Dirac um, Green's function. So we're going to start off. I'll just rewrite this as mu v mu minus m alpha sigma okay and then here's our direct greens function oops e to the minus i k nu x nu minus y nu, and then we have this uh, k um, we have this k minus k rho gamma rho plus m and we have this sigma beta and then we have minus k lambda k lambda plus m squared, okay? So what are the things we can do here? Well, the first thing we're, that we're gonna wanna do is really just do some a couple of uh, algebraic manipulations. And so the first manipulation is gonna be right here where I'm just gonna move this inside the integral, not changing anything when I do that. Okay not changing anything when I do that, but when I do that, now I have to change, but uh, when I do that, now the derivative with respect to mu, this right here, is going to act on this function. And when it acts on this function, it takes out this k mu, and what we get is a k, or this, what we get is k mu, right? So we have this k nu, and when we act on it with the derivative, we're gonna get this k mu, here. Okay. So I'm just going to erase that and do k uh, mu. And we have an i up front also that came forward because of the constant. Okay. And then uh, the i minus i, or the i times i, is going to give us a negative 1. Right, so we can then take this guy here and just move a few things around. And rewrite a few things. So the i times i was minus 1. Then we have this, we have this k mu, and we have this gamma. Um, uh, mu, like that. So now what we want to do is we want to take a, t take a look at this numerator and see what this equals. Right, so let's just take a, take a look at that numerator here. So what we're going to get first is uh, gamma mu uh, alpha sigma k mu uh, k rho uh, gamma rho uh, sigma beta plus m really we're really just distributing things over m uh, alpha sigma k 
okay, row, uh, let's see, it's gonna be gamma row, and it's gonna be sigma beta, and then we're gonna have minus, um, mu uh, alpha sigma, and then k mu m delta sigma beta, and then we're gonna have minus m alpha sigma, m sigma beta okay now and that's all over this denominator but we're not going to worry with the denominator right now because you know, we'll, we'll worry about it later uh right so this here is going to stay the same So I'm just going to copy that. I'm just going to keep that the same for right now. And then what I want to do here is, let's see here. So we're just, the, the delta functions are going to just uh, collapse our, they're going to collapse our indices. So we're going to get uh, plus m k rho alpha beta, right? Because the sigma is going to go away with the delta. As a, again, the delta is whenever alpha and sigma are the same, they're go it's going to be one. Whenever they're different, the whole term is going to go to zero. We can do the same thing for the other term, which is going to be gamma mu alpha beta, right? Uh, K mu m, and then we're gonna have an m squared delta alpha beta. All right. Getting a little shorter, which is nice. Uh, I promise this isn't this is going to be super long. Um, so next, we're going to want to just rearrange a few things. Also, also, so I'll rearrange this k mu, k rho, right, and then we're going to have mu here, and we're going to have an alpha sigma, and rho sigma beta. Okay, and then minus m squared sigma alpha beta. And the reason for doing that, again, is because we're, we can see that um, this here is the same, and these are the same also. It's just different indices. And um, But again, we're summing over... The, this is the same thing because the rho and the rho are the same, and because the mu and the mu are the same here. All right, so we're basically... Uh, something over the same thing for both of them. So we can get rid of those. And we're left with um, this right here, which is good. We're getting even shorter. That's, that's good, good news for us. Next, we're going to want to, uh, we're gonna have K mu. Uh, let's see here. Uh, and then K rho. And then gamma mu alpha beta, and then gamma rho alpha beta, uh, not alpha beta, sigma beta. Uh, so I've just actually expanded this more. So sigma beta, we can always expand and we can always decompress. M squared 
alpha beta okay um, okay the reason for doing that now is because we can uh, we can now factor a alpha beta out of this right because these guys here these are going to result in a delta alpha beta right so k mu k rho gamma mu uh, gamma rho sigma alpha beta minus m squared alpha alpha beta and then we're going to get k um, k mu k rho sigma mu sigma rho minus m squared alpha beta like that and recall also that this was something that we did in a previous video um, that we, should, we were able to show that this, um, I believe it was that, plus m squared equaled d rho plus m squared. We were able to show this, I believe this was in our, uh, when we were talking about gauge, or when we were actually talking about, um, I actually can't remember which video it was, but I do, I do have my notes that we did go over this. Um, anyways, we, we did go over this. You can go back uh, to my videos. I believe it was in my videos on uh, gauge transformations. Or not gauge transformations, on the... Oh, I remember which video it was. It was on the video where we were talking about uh, the Dirac delta function, or the Dirac equation, and we were working with this operator here. I want to say that was video 16, but um, you'll be able to find it easily now with that reference. Uh, okay, and then we have... Uh, so given this, right, so given this, we are able to now show, right, because this here is essentially this, or this, all of this right here is essentially this, just with a different sign, right? And what we can do now is we can say that we have k mu uh, or actually no mu on the bottom k mu it doesn't really matter that much k mu minus m squared alpha beta all right so all of this is now able to uh, cancel with that right there. So what do we get? Well, when we're able to cancel this with this, we are left with just this in the numerator. So our result, I'm going to copy paste a few things. Our result is Uh, copy paste and then we're gonna have a delta alpha beta right and what does this equal well this is equal to our delta function at x mu minus y mu. Right, in this case it's a mu, but again it doesn't matter, it's a delta function and this works. So this checks out 
because we were saying that that was all equal to this initially. And so by saying that, we, that this was all equal to that initially, uh, we, and by making the claim that our Green's function looked like, um, like this with this factor in there, then we're able to show that that Green's function indeed does satisfy the equation of motion for spinners or for Dirac spinners. Okay. This is now proof. This is now closure, whatever you want to call it, that the screen's function indeed works for our system, for our spinner system or for our spinner field. Let's go, let's quickly recap fields. Uh, I'll do it over here. Um, the fields and what exactly we're looking at here. So we have a spinner field. So here's our spinner field. Here's a little chunk of space time. We've reduced, again, we're reducing um, four dimensional space time down to a two dimensional thing. But the point is that we have a delta function, right? It doesn't matter if the delta function is in 2D, 3D, or 4D. This, the point is that it's a delta function and it represents the an excitation or where a particle is, right? And so here's our delta function at this point. Then we have another delta function at this point, right, at say y mu, and this one's at x mu. And we want to know how Um, I'm going to select this really quick, bring it down a little bit more. I might. So the interaction between here is given by alpha beta, right, where uh, this here is, say, beta, and this here is, say, alpha. We're interested in how all the components of these spinners interact with each other given a distance away from each other x mu minus y mu and my apologies that should be a mu but again we have these things have components so these things are a lot more complicated in that uh, we have to keep track of this object as a matrix now this object right here is a, is a, a matrix now that helps us compare or know what the interactions are between these spinners' um, components, uh, as opposed to understanding the interactions between uh, scalar, two scalar points. Again, the two scalar points are represented by delta functions, but we didn't have the added complication of needing to deal with matrices because scalars are their own components. There's no other components to, to them. And what we're going to find is that gauge fields, they are vectors. They're also going to have components to them, and therefore the Green's functions are going to be almost identical. There's going to be some differences because they're, they're vectors, they're not spinners. Um, there's going to, uh, uh, but that's the point. That, that's the point here. We're looking at Green's functions as... Um, these things that describe interactions. And again, at what we've mentioned in the past is that these Green's functions operate within a different type of space, right? They're operating within the, uh, within the uh, Fourier transform of the space, right? Because the waves are the things that interact with each other, not the delta functions. So that's something key to keep in mind also. All right, so we have two delta functions that are representing our particles but the delta functions are not interacting right you have a delta function here and you have a delta function here there's no interaction between the two but when you decompose the field into the waves that make up these delta functions then you can see which waves are interacting with each other and those waves that are interacting with each other are interacting right i literally said the word interacting and so that's why these Green's functions take the form of these four of these things that look like Fourier transforms.
is because we're quite literally taking a Fourier transform of these fields to look at how they're interacting with each other. Right. Okay, so that was a mouthful. And uh, we went over this long proof. In the next video, we're gonna go over uh, Yukawa interactions just a little bit more. We're gonna talk about gauge interactions after that. And then we will dive into quantum mechanics, quantum physics. The quantum physics again, we're gonna go over a review of quantum physics. Then we're gonna dive into quantum field theory. And what we're gonna find in quantum field theory are our beloved creation and annihilation operators. They're gonna act as weights on these, on these waves. We're gonna be able to see how they interact with one another and those interactions fundamentally are what's gonna help us define what makes up a fermion, what makes up a boson and so forth. And so with all of that being said, again, if you like this kind of content, please hit that subscribe button and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye.